J.V. Stalin, The Foundations of Leninism Chapter 1. The Historic Roots of Leninism Leninism grew up and took shape under the conditions of imperialism, when the contradictions of capitalism had reached an extreme point, when the proletariat revolution had become an immediate practical question, when the old period of preparation of the working class for revolution had come up and passed over to a new period, that of the direct assault on capitalism. Lenin called imperialism morbid capitalism. Why? Because imperialism carries the contradictions of capitalism to their last bounds, to the extreme limit, beyond which revolution begins. Of these contradictions, there are three which must be regarded as the most important. The first contradiction is the contradiction between labor and capital. Imperialism is the omnipotence of the monopolist trust and syndicates of the banks and the financial oligarchy in the industrial countries. In the fight against this omnipotence, the customary methods of the working class, trade unions and cooperatives, parliamentary parties, and the parliamentary struggle have proven to be totally inadequate. Either place yourself at the mercy of capital, eke out a wretched existence as of old and sink lower and lower, or adopt a new weapon. This is the alternative imperialism puts before the vast masses of the proletariat. Imperialism brings the working class to revolution. The second contradiction is the contradiction among the various financial groups and imperialist powers in their struggle for sources of raw materials for foreign territory. Imperialism is the export of capital to the sources of raw materials, the frenzied struggle for monopolist possession of these sources, the struggle for a redivision of the already divided world a struggle waged with particular fury by new financial groups and powers seeking a, quote, place in the sun, unquote, against the old groups and powers, which cling tenaciously to what they have seized. This frenzied struggle among the various groups of capitalists is notable in that it includes an inevitable element, imperialist wars, wars for the annexation of foreign territory. This circumstance in its turn, is notable in that it leads to the mutual weakening of the imperialists, to the weakening of the position of capitalism in general, to the acceleration of the advent of the proletarian revolution and the practical necessity of this revolution. The third contradiction is the contradiction between the handful of ruling, quote, civilized, unquote, nations and the hundreds of millions of the colonial independent peoples of the world, Imperialism is the most barefaced exploitation and the most inhumane oppression of hundreds of millions of people inhabiting vast colonies and dependent countries. The purpose of this exploitation and of this oppression is to squeeze out super profits. But in exploiting these countries, imperialism is compelled to build their railways, factories and mills, industrial and commercial centers. The appearance of a class of proletarians, the emergence of a native intelligentsia, the awakening of a national consciousness, the growth of the liberation movement, such are the inevitable results of this policy. The growth of the revolutionary movement in all colonies and dependent countries, without exception, clearly testifies to this fact. This circumstance is of importance for the proletariat inasmuch as it saps radically the position of capitalism by converting the colonies and dependent countries from reserves of imperialism to reserves of proletarian revolution. Such, in general, are the principal contradictions of imperialism which have converted the old, quote, flourishing, unquote, capitalism into morbid capitalism. The significance of the imperialist war, which broke out ten years ago, lies, among other things, in the fact that it gathered all these contradictions into a single knot and threw them onto the scales, thereby accelerating and facilitating the revolutionary battles of the proletariat. In other words, imperialism was instrumental not only in making the revolution a practical inevitability, but also in creating favorable conditions for a direct assault on the citadels of capitalism. Such was the international situation which gave birth to Leninism. Some may say, this is all very well, but what has it to do with Russia? 
which was not and could not be a classical land of imperialism. What has to do with Lenin, who worked primarily in Russia, for Russia? Why did Russia, of all countries, become the home of Leninism, the birthplace of the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution? Because Russia was the focus of all these contradictions of imperialism. Because Russia, more than any other country, was pregnant with revolution. And she alone, therefore, was in a position to solve these contradictions in a very revolutionary way. To begin with, Tsarist Russia was the home of every kind of oppression, capitalist, colonial, and militarist, in its most inhumane and barbarous form. Who does not know that in Russia the omnipotence of capital was combined with the despotism of Tsarism, the aggressiveness of Russian nationalism, with Tsarism's role of executor in regard to the non-Russian peoples, the exploitation of entire regions, Turkey, Persia, China, with the seizure of these regions by Tsarism, with wars of conquest. Lenin was right in saying that Tsarism was military feudal imperialism. Tsarism was a concentration of the worst features of imperialism, rise to a high pitch. To proceed, Tsarist Russia was a major reserve of Western imperialism. Not only the sense that it gave free entry to foreign capital, which controlled such basic branches of Russia's national economy as the fuel and metallurgical industries, but also in the sense that it could supply the Western imperialists with millions of soldiers. Remember the Russian army, 14 million strong, which shed its blood on the imperialist fronts to safeguard the staggering profits of the British and French capitalists. Further, Tsarism was not only the watchdog of imperialism in the east of Europe, but, in addition, it was the agent of Western imperialism for squeezing out of the population hundreds of millions by way of interest on loans obtained in Paris, London, Berlin, and Brussels. Finally, Tsarism was a most faithful ally of Western imperialism in the partition of Turkey, Persia, China, etc., who does not know that the imperialist war was waged by Tsarism in alliance with the imperialists of the Entente, and that Russia was an essential element in that war? This is why the interests of Tsarism and of Western imperialism were interwoven and ultimately became merged in a single skein of imperialist interests. Could Western imperialism resign itself to the loss of such a powerful support in the East and such a rich reservoir of manpower and resources as old Tsarist bourgeois Russia was, without exerting all its strength to wage a life-and-death struggle against the revolution in Russia, with the object of defending and preserving Tsarism? Of course not. But from this it follows that whoever wanted to strike at Tsarism necessarily raised his hand against imperialism. Whoever rose against Tsarism had to rise against imperialism as well. For whoever was bent on overthrowing Tsarism had to overthrow imperialism too. If he really intended not merely to defeat Tsarism, but to make a clean sweep of it, Thus the revolution against Tsarism verged on and had to pass into a revolution against imperialism, into a proletarian revolution. Meanwhile, in Russia, a tremendous popular revolution was rising headed by the most revolutionary proletariat in the world, which possessed such an important ally as the revolutionary peasantry of Russia. Does it need proof that such a revolution could not stop halfway? That in the event of success, it was bound to advance further and rise the banner of revolt against imperialism? This is why Russia was bound to become the focus of the contradictions of imperialism. Not only the sense that it was in Russia that these contradictions were revealed most plainly, in view of their particularly repulsive, particularly intolerable character, and not only because Russia was a highly important prop of Western imperialism, connecting Western finance capital with the colonies in the East, but also because Russia was the only country in which there existed a real force capable of resolving the contradictions of imperialism in a revolutionary way. From this it follows, however, that the revolution in Russia could not but become a proletarian revolution, that from its very inception it could not but assume an international character, and that, therefore, it could not but shake the very foundations of world imperialism. Under these circumstances, could the Russian communists confine their work within the narrow national bounds of the Russian revolution? 
Of course not. On the contrary, the whole situation, both internal, the profound revolutionary crisis, and external, the war, impelled them to go beyond these bounds in their work to transfer the struggle to the international arena, to expose the ulcers of imperialism, to prove that the collapse of capitalism was inevitable, to smash social chauvinism and social pacifism, and finally to overthrow capitalism in their own country, and to forge a new fighting weapon for the proletariat, the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution in order to facilitate the task of overthrowing capitalism for the proletarians of all countries. Nor could the Russian communists act otherwise, for only this path offered the chance of producing certain changes in the international situation which could safeguard Russia against the restoration of the bourgeois order. That is why Russia became the home of Leninism and why Lenin, the leader of the Russian Communists, became its creator. The same thing, approximately, quote, happened, unquote, in the case of R Russia and Lenin, as in the case of Germany and Marx and Engels in the 40s of the last century. Germany at the time was pregnant with bourgeois revolution, just like Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Marx wrote at the time in the Communist Manifesto, Quote, the communists turned their attention chiefly to Germany because the country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th and of France in the 18th century and because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In other words, the center of the revolutionary movement was shifting to Germany. There can hardly be any doubt that it was this very circumstance, noted by Marx in the above quoted passage, that served as the probable reason why it was precisely Germany that became the birthplace of scientific socialism, and why the leaders of the German proletariat, Marx and Engels, became its creators. The same, only to a still greater degree, must be said of Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Russia was then on the eve of the bourgeois revolution. She had to accomplish this revolution at a time when conditions in Europe were more advanced, and were with a proletariat that was more developed than that of Germany in the 40s of the 19th century, let alone Britain and France. Moreover, all the evidence went to show that this revolution was bound to serve as a ferment and as a prelude to the proletarian revolution. We cannot regard it as accidental. That is, early as 1902, when the Russian Revolution was still in an embryonic state, Lenin wrote the prophetic words in his pamphlet, What is to be Done, quote, History has now confronted us with an immediate task, which is the most revolutionary of all the immediate tasks that confront the proletariat of any country, that the fulfillment of this task, the destruction of the most powerful bulwark, not only of European, but also of Asiatic reaction, would make the Russian proletariat the vanguard of the international revolutionary proletariat." Unquote. In other words, the center of the revolutionary movement was bound to shift to Russia. As we know, the course of the revolution in Russia has more than vindicated Lenin's prediction. Is it surprising, after all this, that a country which has accomplished such a revolution and possesses such a proletariat should have been the birthplace of the theory and the tactics of the proletarian revolution? Is it surprising that Lenin, the leader of Russia's proletariat, became also the creator of this theory and tactics and the leader of the international proletariat?